Hi, and welcome back to Creative Live TV. I am Kate Dessa, and I'm excited to return back with our work from home cafe with Andrew Scrivani. Just a reminder for all of you, we've taken off a few weeks to evolve our content and I'm really excited to bring Andrew back on um, to show some really great recipes today. I'm really excited. Uh, Andrew is gonna be teaching us how to make ramen from his kitchen in New Jersey. Again, Andrew Scrivani is a famous food photographer. He is a New York Times food photographer and one of our favorite instructors. So today he's going to be teaching us how to make ramen and then we're going to take beautiful pictures of it. So welcome back to the show, Andrew. So excited to be back up and running. Oh, me too. Uh, I know that it's been a few weeks and a lot has happened in the world and we are um, our obviously um, trying to respond in a way that's appropriate and respectful and tells a story about uh, that um, is one that's more expansive. And I think that uh, for me, that starts right here in my home. Um, I know I've spent a lot of time over the first uh, couple of months of this uh, cooking things that are uniquely familiar to me as an Italian American growing up in New York. Uh, and also as somebody who has spent a lot of time in kitchens professionally as a, as a stylist and as a photographer. Uh, but one of, the th one of the stories that sort of is still to be told um, about myself and about my evolution as a cook and an eater is one that is close to home. It's that I live in a multiracial household and um, my wife is Korean. She was born in Korea. And um, I had no experience at all with Korean food whatsoever growing up. Uh, I didn't even understand um, the basics of Asian cuisine when I was a young man because we just pretty much ate American or Italian food. Uh, I've obviously uh, had an, an expansion of my palate in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that one of the ways I would like to share the work from home cafe is not only is my um, personal life multicultural, but obviously through my experiences in food, I've learned to understand and appreciate culture in a way that um, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to. But um, food is the obvious one, one of the most obvious first point, first contact connectors with new culture and new people and a way to experience food uh, is to experience somebody's culture. So uh, I want to open by saying that that's one of the goals that we're gonna kind of try to achieve here at Work From Home Cafe is to share the experiences I've had in opening up both my palate, my mind, and, and my uh, culinary ability to the idea that different cultures have influenced me in such a, in such a profound way. Yeah, and I think that, you know, from the conversations that we had before we were deciding to come back uh, and bring back Work From Home Cafe it was really a lot to do with what you're saying, which is food is an equalizer and it bring, breaks down barriers between people and cultures in a way that uh, really makes things uh, easier to understand. When you understand that people eat food similarly to you, it breaks down this barrier of someone being different because ultimately it is, we're all gathering around. I think we talked a little bit about food and music kind of being these cultural equalizers and something that we all uh, take part in and how it connects us all. And so I'm excited to really dive into a, a little bit more um, of a culturally diverse foods so we can help kind of break down some barriers for people and help people understand how closely connected we are through food and culture. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about this in my book. I've, I've taught about it at Creative Live, my, my class that's available on food photography that goes back now six or seven years. Uh, talk about um, being taking cultural cues when cooking and when photographing and styling food and understanding that cultural sensitivity isn't about things like being genuine or authentic. I try to stay away from words like that. I think it becomes more personal and that if you give attribution to where you found the inspiration for a particular seasoning or a particular type of food or the way you're going to style something or the kind of bowl you're going to use. Um, I think attribution in photography is a big deal. And I think it is in food as well, is that if we're going to share culture, 
we have to acknowledge where it comes from. And I know that I've been talking about that for a long time, but this is the first time uh, I've had to actually verbalize it in a way that says this is intentional. Uh, and, yeah. and it's in a very, it's a very intentional practice to, um, to give attribution when creative people, whether they be cooks or photographers or video people, whatever we do in our careers, um, acknowledging that, that what they're bringing to the table has merit and that we learn from it. So, um, like I said, I learned so much. My wife's name is Sujong. She comes from uh, a little town that's part of the greater Seoul area called Mapo. You might've heard of their tofu. Um, <laughs> and uh, that, that's, um, you know, that part of the world um, prior to modern time where we see South Korea as a, a powerhouse economically. And obviously they have the, the troubles that they have with their, um, their former brother to the north. Um, <laughs> their foods have evolved over a few different things. And one has to do with their um, cultural um, proximity to Japan. And the fact that Japan had once occupied Korea and there was uh, a lot of poverty and there was a lot of kind of war-torn problems that happened in South Korea prior to them becoming what they are today. Uh, and food was, uh, quite often influences, uh, is, is a reflection of where a lot of things that have happened in history. And I think that one of the things that I've learned in, in studying a little bit about this and speaking to my in-laws and understanding um, the, the motivation for making what they call ramyeon um, is, uh, is, is an interesting sort of story. And it's one that I don't know that a lot of people know. Uh, I'll tell it because when my daughter, uh, I was married before and I had a daughter and she was three years old when I met Sujan. And Julia was an American kid who grew up in an Italian household and she was three. So she didn't really have much of a palate. Um, and at that point she started to experience uh, Asian flavors and Asian food. And one of the things that she always enjoyed was when Sujan would make her ramyeon, which is what I'm gonna make today. Um, and when she went to college, which is sort of the hotbed of people who eat ramen because it's the cheapest <laughs> food and you can cook it on your hot stove, you know, your hot plate in college or dorm rooms, she was appalled because first of all, when she called it ramyeon, people looked at her like she was crazy. She's like, what? <laughs> like, why are you mispronouncing it? Um, and secondly, it didn't have all of the things that we would put on it um, uh, at home and what Sujang would make for her. So there was, there's this um, affection for the food uh, and has a, a deep personal sort of uh, history for, for me. And I think that a lot of the foods that I've shared with you so far have been about these sort of family favorites and these kind of emotional connections we make to food. And this one is just as deep and just as personal. So um, I want to explain a couple of things about it first. So what you know yeah. as ramen, especially if you're eating at like fancy ramen shops in New York or Seattle or L.A., is that um, Japanese ramen is based on the, the broth, which quite often is a dashi broth. But there are many different styles of the broth. Uh, and then there's the noodle, which is originally based uh, from China, which is what China introduced the wheat noodle to pretty much the whole world. So. Um, those the combination of those two things uh it makes japanese ramen unique um and that it is a little bit more gourmet if you want to look at it from that perspective it's still street food but it was born of craft um korean uh ramyeon it starts with this the thing we're all really familiar with right we're really familiar with um dried uh packaged instant noodles and then from there uh, what Korean people have done, and at least my experience with the people that are in my family, is it's all about dressing that up, dressing that up to be more gourmet, be more uh, filling, uh, to have more of a cultural flavor to it. And then it's something that becomes unique to the culture. And I think that now that we've looked at, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, they ramen and ramyeon have different sort of uh, origins in a way. They have they intersect, yeah. but they definitely have different origins and um, and different motivations. Like I said, uh, Korea was in a bad way 
um, you know, when all of this was happening from the time when the, when the noodle was something that they were making uh, dried and like this, um, it was something that was affordable and you can add a little protein and you can add a little vegetable and you can add a little seasoning and make it your own. Uh, and that's everyone. And what you'll see is that there's no recipe here. There's no, there's nothing to write down. This is all about yeah. assembling ingredients and then putting together the things that make you happy in your bowl. So I'm going to show you a couple of things that I've already prepared, which are pretty classic things that you can put um, in. Uh, so you have, uh, I have these eggs, which are sort of six and a half minute eggs. They're a little jammy and really nice. Uh, I have some chopped sausage, uh, some, I said fish that I've filleted. I have a uh, poached chicken breast here. Um, I have some scallions, some corn that I've co co cooked and cut off the cob, uh, some kimchi, of course, uh, and some what you would, uh, what Trader Joe's calls a seaweed snack, uh, what the Japanese call nori, uh, which is, I guess you can see it here. Uh, uh, Korean people call it gim. So uh, when you hear that, uh, we, we eat the seaweed snacks at home uh, by themselves. And sometimes you kind of sit there with a bowl of rice and grab the rice with the seaweed snack and eat it. So that's fun. One of the things we always put on top of our ramyun is uh, sesame oil. And okay. that always makes it a little bit more special got a really nice flavor to it. Now, uh, if you're familiar with Korean cuisine, you know what gochujang is, which is a yep. chili, a red chili paste, a soy based chili paste. You would put this on pretty much anything in Korean culture or cook with it. Uh, and then of course, everybody's favorite uh, sriracha. So all of these things are become sort of part of the assembly process uh, of what we eat at home. And then, um, uh, yeah. Let me ahead. ask you this. Uh, yeah. what do you, in terms of, uh, sriracha versus gojujang, uh, what, like how, how do you use them differently? You know, they, they kind of have similar profiles. One, you know, for me personally, when I'm using gojujang, it's more, um, as an ingredient within, you know, a broth mm -hmm. or, uh, something that I'm making while sriracha I kind of use as a sauce a to a spice it up of... after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, is that I mean, I think, how you would describe the two? I think in this case we would use yes, I would because I think you cook with gochujang differently than you would cook with sriracha. But in this case, you could use them interchangeably as a hot sauce or, or something okay. as a flavor enhancer. You have to be careful when you're dealing with um, ramyun coming from an instant package because it has uh, already a very high salt food. And you don't want to continually add more ingredients that have a lot of salt in them. So mm. I think that's where using a hot sauce versus a gochujang might be a little bit better for you if you don't want to eat a whole lot of salt because everything starts to build the amount of salt okay. in these things. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, one of the things you can do if you don't want as much uh, salt in this is use a little less of the flavor packet and then add seasoning as you go at the at the back end. Right. You can add a little okay. more gochujang. You can add a little more sriracha, add a little more uh, so, um, soy sauce. You could add um, uh, sesame oil and that will all enhance the flavor. Because I know a lot of people are super sensitive to the idea that the package ramen is very, very salty. Yeah. So you have yeah. to be careful. And let me ask you another question. Do you, so I noticed the brand of ramen that you had was called kimchi. I think if I, I if I remember from well, the glance, I don't, I get, it says kimchi flavor and, and it's written okay. in, uh, I think we're written in a few languages here. And it, a lot of these, um, are products of, let's see, this one actually comes out of California. It's made in California. It's made in California. So some of them, when you go into an Asian grocer, you could get them that have Chinese writing on them. You have ones that have yep. Korean writing on them, Japanese writing on them. Um, at the end of the day, they're all very similar and you find the one that you like the best. Um, I know yep. we have a couple of favorites, uh, but during pandemic, we were sort of uh, prisoner to whatever was at the shop <laughs> and then we got to yep. make it, make it our own. Uh, we found a few um, quality Asian markets here eventually, and then we were able to pick up some of the things we like, but not all the brands that we like. So it's sort of, you know, it's like anything else. You, you try to find the brands that uh, you're most familiar and comfortable with. 
but if you don't, then you just got to kind of play with them until you find what you like. So, yeah. So there's, um, All right. there's, a, a, there's a woman that I am friendly with. Uh, I met her many years ago um, when she was first starting out sort of on YouTube. Uh, she's a, a Korean cook and she goes by Mangchi and she's on YouTube and she's fantastic. And uh, I watched some of her videos today because she was talking about Ramyun. And uh, one of the things I, I took away from it was when we make it, it's sort of you, you kind of a lot of times just feel around for the right amount of water. And Mangchi says, two and a half cups of water. No more, no less. So I'm okay. going to try it that way today. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Man Manchi says two and a half. I believe Manchi because, you know, I've eaten her food and uh, and, and she's made a, a pretty pretty cool career out of cooking Korean food um, on YouTube. So I'm going to go with uh, her recommendation. She sounds like the expert. <laughs> yes. And then the other thing that I'm, uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, how to make this... Um, sort of a Korean egg pancake that sort of gets used in a lot of different presentations. And basically you create a very thin sort of crepe like um, egg in a frying pan, and then you roll it up and cut it into very uh, small slivered ribbons. So I'm gonna show you that technique today. Um, what I wanna do is also tell you that these eggs that I made um, are a very simple, I know these are like the, the holy grail of making soft boiled eggs to get them like jammy and perfect like this. You get them in the, in fancy restaurants is um, get the water boiling, submer submerge the eggs, let them go for six and a half minutes, and then immediately take them out and plunge them into ice water. And then when you take the shells oh. off after two minutes, two minutes, let them cool down to in the ice water for two minutes, take them out and then the shells come right off and then they're still a little liquidy, but give them a, like a, a few minutes on the counter, and then they end up getting kind of jammy and, and perfect. So that's that's really nice about um, those eggs. Like, and I also just poached the chicken in some chicken stock, um, and I, I I cooked it for about 20 minutes until it was you know 160 170 inside, and sliced it up. You can also shred it. You can do a lot of different things with that, um, and that's it. I fried some. This is fresh. Uh, the the, um, the fish that was on that plate is fresh uh, sea bass that was caught uh, by my neighbor here, and we ate it last night for dinner. Uh, he sent over a bunch of um, he sent over a bunch of uh, fresh fish, and uh, I cooked some for dinner last night and kept some for this, so we would have a little to show that we can actually put that on the ramen as well. So nice. So I'm gonna start with that two and a half cups of water, and uh, and get that going i'll put on my chesty in a minute because I'll, I'll i'll do the eggs for you guys as well so so here's all right gotta make sure it's a half two and a half okay monkey says two and a half all right so we're gonna get that going get the water boiling now um korean people have kind of as most uh, cultures do have like kind of specific cookware for specific things. If you've seen bibimbap in a restaurant and come yeah. in with a bowl, a dolso, a dolso uh, bibimbap where then the, the rice gets all crusty on the inside and then you scrape it up with the, with the spoon. That's the fun part of the eating bibimbap like that. Uh, there's also, um, uh, there's a dish where you take the leftover rice and you mash it in the bottom of the, the pot and then you scorch it and then it eventually lifts away from the, the pan and it becomes like a crispy cracker. And that's really a, that's a, a fun a fun thing to do with leftover yeah. rice. That's also very Korean. But uh, the, the ramen, the ramen that they make uh, is usually this kind of tin pot that's very thin bottomed and that is, it, the water boils really fast in it. And I think that's one of the, so I'm using the, my best approximation of that pot right now which is the sort of a smaller, lighter pot. So we're going to try that. Uh, and then All in right. the meanwhile, I'm going to also uh, mix up the egg. I should put on the chesty. So why don't we, why don't we, why don't we take a second while I put the chesty on and, uh, and I'll bring you over to the stove. All right. Sounds good. Can, I'll ask you a couple questions while you're getting the chesty going. Um, one is, you know, you mentioned these 
different pots. Most of us probably don't have, you know, uh, Asian cooking utensils. So what if we don't have, uh, you know, those types of utensils, what would you recommend us using? Well, I think the size of this pot is really is the key, right? And the fact that it has a okay. cover. So I think the fact that it has a cover and the size of the pot, because you want the you want the water to just break this, you know, like the cover the the pasta, the, the noodle. You know, you want it to just cover it so that when yeah. you uh because okay. you're gonna reach in at about the halfway point with the tongs and flip it over and then put the cover back on it. So that's yeah. kind of that's kind of the reason why you want to have it in a smaller pot, you know, so this sort of just fits inside. That okay. works out. That works out, I think, the best um, for that. I um, mean, in terms of anything else, I mean, most people have some chopsticks at home from their last uh, delivery that they got from whatever restaurant, or unless you, kept, yeah. you keep them at home. Um, and I think that, that when assembling it, I, I, as you've seen me here before for everything, I, usually use chopsticks or tweezers to assemble food <laughs> in a styling way. So uh, I'm comfortable with them. So that actually helps me. Um, okay, so I got this one and now this one I gotta get going. So I'm gonna add one egg. I'm gonna flip you, flip you down for a sec. Well, actually, no, we're gonna put the right. chest on. All right, I'm gonna put you on here. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me flip you. Yeah, see, we've been out of practice for a couple of weeks, so. Yeah, uh, we have. So. Right. Oh, I did it again. I took. I forgot to give the take the thing with me. So um, I think we're almost there. Okay. All right. There we go. Which one do I want to make sure I can see? Okay, so you guys see? Yep, we can see you. Okay. We're looking at you now. Oh yeah, that's right. So I want to flip that camera. There. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's locked in, so I'm afraid it's gonna fall right into the pot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can make that work. I think that'll be. <laughs> So uh, first thing I want to do is, um, you can see my hands, right? Yeah. I'm going to mix up some egg and a little bit of water so it's a little thinner. And I'm going to make this egg pancake. So this has always been something that in my head seems like a very delicate process because they get it so thin and it yeah. feels like you need like almost like a a crepe uh you know skillet to make this work in my head so I'm excited to see you do it on a regular uh regular frying pan and do it at home because I've just always in my head assumed that this had some special technique or tools involved yeah, you know, a crepe pan is a nice thing to have, but really what you're trying to do is flatten it out as much as possible. So I would say go with the biggest one you got. Go with the okay. biggest pan, and then look, I'm going to pour it in, and then I'm going to swirl it and try to get it all the way around the edges. And it's already very thin. If you can, yeah, there we go. We can see it a little better now. All right. So, and then I'm going to let that cook and then I'm going to flip it as best I can. I think I got two. I got two. And it cooks super fast. You can see it's already kind of getting yeah. firm. I could probably do like a, like a chef's flip, but I'm not going to try that on, on live television. That would be... <laughs> a disaster if I mess it up so um and sometimes do you see like they put um like scallions or um does does anything ever go in these egg pancakes in this one uh I haven't made it that way uh maybe okay. are you thinking of pajon which is Korean pancake? Ah, 
that's yes, different. That makes um, what I'm thinking. And that's yeah. that, that's actually bread, right? But it does have egg in it, but it's it not is, it's not egg based totally. No, it's not egg based. It's definitely more of a um uh like a pancake batter. Yeah, okay. Rice I think uh, that is it could be rice based. It, sometimes it's wheat based. Um, but that's definitely more of a uh more of a pancake style. I'm gonna make some room here. I'm gonna take this off the flame in a second. So there's that. Whoop. Okay. See, there it is. I'm gonna bring it over. I'm gonna let that cool off on the counter for a second. And then I'll show you how I don't wanna touch it yet because uh, I would rather not burn my fingers today. So. In the meanwhile, this is almost boiling. You can see we're getting close to boiling. I'm going to go get a scissor. There's a half eaten sandwich on the counter. See, this is real people. <laughs> There's some real stuff going on. Half eaten sandwiches. So, um, don't use your teeth on these, you know, not good for this. All that dental that your parents paid for. So like this mm -hmm. is very common a circle. Yeah. Of the wrong of the ramen and but don't just dump it in there because you got some surprises in here you got this is the soup mix right can you see it yeah there we go this yep. is soup mix there that's go. gonna go in and then at the end we have these little uh like flakes of like vegetable flakes that come with it and i know these are kim these are probably kimchi flakes yeah it, because this is the kimchi um this is the kimchi flavor so a lot of times it's different vegetables uh, that we use. So um, I'm going to try to roll this now. Should be cool enough to handle. Uh, make a nice tight tube. And I'm rolling. And from what I saw, you didn't put any seasoning on it beforehand, right? Nope. You could season it with salt and pepper, whatever, but this dish, you know, obviously there's so much seasoning already. That yeah, it's it's uh it's not really that necessary. So now I'm gonna kind of just continue to go right down the line here and and make these little ribbons. And you could see I could take a break here and just show you that we have these kind of pretty pretty ribbons yeah. that come out of this. And this is really nice to have. Considering I cannot see my hands, this is a really uh, delicate operation. So if anybody uh, scream if you think I'm getting too close to my fingers. I think I'm giving. I think I'm giving myself. No, I think enough, you're doing pretty good. Giving myself enough room here. I think you do it by feel. Oh, not bad. Okay. And our water is boiling. Hooray. Okay. So I'm gonna put this in. So one thing that I used to do growing up, which I think is a mistake, is breaking the ramen up beforehand when you put it in. You shouldn't no, that, break it up. It just throw it in as is, correct? Yep. And uh, I put the, the seasoning on top. And now I'm going to cover this and let it boil for a minute or two. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and flip it. Uh, and then another minute or two. Now, once this is in this state where we're, um, where we uh, actually, you know what? Let me, let me go back to the tripod so I can talk to the camera. Give me one second and I will All right. bring you and back. I'll remind everyone, this is the Work From Home Cafe. Uh, I am Kate Dessa, the host, and I'm here with Andrew Scrivani today. We are teaching you how to make ramen. Uh, and Andrew right now is switching over cams so he can talk us through a few other uh, accoutrements that will go in our ramen before we start plating, which is ramen is super simple. We are using uh, ramen noodles from, is it a Korean uh, brand that you're using or do you know? Is it a Chinese uh, I, brand? You know what? Oh, uh, no, you I said it was, it was in it California, was, right? Yeah, it's definitely... Um... The, the brand itself is from California, so I don't know exactly what culture they're. I know it's called the kimchi flavor, um, and it's 
got got a little label on it that says it's made in America, taste of Korea. So uh, it's, uh, I'm going to take that at face value and see how that goes. But um, in the meanwhile, I think it's time to flip our, our noodles over. So we're just going to give them a flip. And one of the things I wanted to talk about with this um, is there are a lot of different ways that you can in introduce egg into this. So I've done it so many different ways. Now, like right now, if you poured an egg in there, it would poach. And then you would have yeah. a beautiful poached egg and you'd fish it out and put it on top. Uh, the other way that we could do it is you can kind of make like an egg drop where you scramble the egg and pour it in there or put an egg in there and scramble it while it's in there. So you get like a thready kind of eggy uh, mm. thing that you could do. So we've done it every single way you can do it in, in our house. Um, we've added egg in so many different ways to this because it just makes it, you know, sometimes it feels like it tasted a little different depending on how the egg is cooked. But yeah. I mean, for the most part, it's not um, it's not a, a hard and fast rule to do it any which way. So I think this is probably done and we can give it a test. I'm going to stir through. It still maybe feels a tiny bit firm. So I'm going to give that just another minute to keep cooking. Um, everybody knows what ramen in the pot looks like right it's not it's not, <laughs> we're, not, we're not breaking new ground um but uh we're gonna serve this in uh in sort of just a deep soup bowl and uh we we quite often use um the asian style spoons that have like a, a broader base or a long-handled korean spoon like so koreans eat with uh, a long-handled tablespoon uh, very often, especially when you eat bibimbap, because it's good for the scraping, like I said. But it's um, that's a, like more of a traditional sort of utensil for this, which we don't have at this at this house. We have them at home in New York. Um, but I think uh, it's also completely um, legit to just kind of slurp uh, instead of using a spoon. So, yeah. Totally. All right, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this down. I think we're good. I'm going to give it one last stir to incorporate that seasoning a little bit more. And uh, then I'm going to bring you down to the tabletop again. So here we go. All right. So we still have this egg on here. So I'm going to leave it on here for now. Just All right. Get it, get it out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So we're going to add this into the bowl. Perfect. Mong Chi was right, two and a half, worked out perfect. So it's a little brothy, which is nice if that's how you like it. Now I'm gonna just start adding the things that I would traditionally like to eat in this. So I'm gonna go um, some scallion and I'm gonna just pile everything kind of right on top. And I like corn, I love corn in my soup. Definitely something that I enjoy. So I would think that the way Sujong makes it for me um, is a little less brothy than this. So I think okay. if we went, uh, we're going uh, Manchi method, um, I think I would go a quarter of a cup less. So that one would Yeah, really... I always tend to have a little less broth in my ramen too. Yeah. This feels, yeah, this feels a, li a little bit more like a soup than it does uh yeah, I, I always tended to to have less less uh, broth in mine. Yeah, I'm gonna take a little out to tell you the truth, because I my egg sunk and I want to see my egg. Yeah. So I'm gonna take some of this. Out. I want to see some the of these ingredients. Yeah, I want to see some of these ingredients uh, kind of peeking out the top. I take out some of this, and then. Yeah, I think this is way better. And I think what we're doing is we've probably taken out about a quarter to a half a cup of that uh, liquid. So, but what it might have done for us uh, in terms of our taste is probably, I'm going to taste it. Yeah, it's, oh, that's a nice flavor. But it is definitely not as salty. And I think what I want to do also is replace my egg with another egg. That's less emerged. Immer emerge. Emerged. Emerged. Is that a word? <laughs> I, 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 I said word. submerged. Submerged. 
Okay. There uh, so we I got go. some proteins here. Uh, so if I were showing you these proteins, Kate, which one would you be your uh, addition here? Uh, I think I would probably go for the pork. You would. Okay, great. Yeah. So we're going to go with a little bit of the pork sausage. Now, roasted pork is also something that um, you could definitely uh, eat with this. Uh, to, that's a sort of a traditional Japanese ramen sort of thing. But I think every every culture uh, has some sort of pork. But the sausage yeah. is definitely something we can uh, we can incorporate here. So I'm going to put that there. Um, I made a mess is there an ever a world where you would mix them together? Oh, you could. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't yeah. think there's any. You see, like I said, we're not really working from rules here. No, there's so no rules. Exactly. And I'm going to add some kimchi to this. All right. And before I do anything else, I want to clean my bowl because if we're going to be actually photographing this, this is a little bit sloppy, which I don't like. Um, we are going to toggle back and forth between food and photography here, right? So if we're thinking of this in terms of making a pretty picture, uh, making that edge of the bowl a little more presentable helps. Not perfect, but better. Okay, so I may give it a little more scallion just for decoration, and then I will take some and there is one option for the presentation. I mean, we used almost everything. The only thing we didn't use was the uh, shredded egg because we already have an egg in there. Um, and then I think we're gonna go sriracha. Looks good. And there we have it. We have our bowl we of go. ramen. Uh, ramyeon. Or if you are going by my uh, cultural reference and my um, household, we call this ramyeon. Uh, and I, I kind of went over that a little bit earlier. That's more of a Korean presentation. Uh, and I think that uh, we should take that over and get a picture of it. How are we doing on time, by the way? Because I know we so, talked a little bit more than we normally do. Um, uh, how, uh, we're actually doing pretty good. It's about 1240 right now. Oh, um, I'm going to take this off. And I know i got to carry you over to the table and get everything set up. I already have my camera ready. We have nice light today. Yeah. Go get the laptop. So we so. have people tuning in from all over. We have India, yeah, have Chicago. Any uh um, london no question let's see if we have any questions coming in we have a lot of ramen lovers so i am going to remove the apron because it is hot here <laughs> and i got some fresh chopsticks and we're gonna go sand spoon And this one I made for you, right? Because you wanted the uh, the pork. Yep. These are really measly little <laughs> little chopsticks. <laughs> the ones we have at home. So a lot of times when you go to Korean restaurant, you'll see that um, they use uh, metal chopsticks quite often. That's uh, a pretty standard thing you find in a lot of Korean restaurants. All right. So I'm going to start and... off with. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, do you, I mean, I, I've just found that metal chopsticks often can be a little bit more slippery than, than wood chopsticks. Um, is they're, there, they're, is that typically yeah. just for reuse or is there a preference in terms of, uh, the material, the chopstick stick is made out of? Um, I prefer wood. Uh, I know that the metal is definitely because they're reusable. It's like having utensils yeah. in your home. Um, but I do also agree with you that I have kind of slippery. I don't. I don't use chopsticks as uh, adeptly as I could, and I think that it would be better if I. Uh, I think it would be better if I just stick with the wood ones. <laughs> so um, 
So can you can see, uh, I should put you a little higher for the table cam. I think you would yeah. be better if you were up here. Okay. Just give me one second. Um, All right. And I will get you up a little higher. Sounds good. And I'll remind everybody tuning in. Uh, this is Creative Live TV. This is our new live stream coming to you from the kitchens and homes and studios of uh, our favorite creators. Today we're in Andrew Scrivani's New Jersey home for our work from home cafe. Uh, Andrew is teaching us how to make ramyeon today, which is a Korean version of ramen, uh, very similar, but in Korea they call it ram ramyeon instead of ramen. Uh, we have made we have made the ramen, and now we are getting ready to take some beautiful photos of it. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start at around uh, 800. ISO 125th of a second at 4.0 aperture and see what that gets me uh, in terms of lighting. Still feels a little dark to me, uh, which means that some of the things that I brought here with me uh, will help. I have the ones that we made uh, last time, some bounce cards. And Great. I'm gonna stand this one up on end. Hopefully not block the camera, push back some light. And I'm also going to go to uh, 1600 ISO at four and a half aperture at 125th of a second. And there it is. We have nice light. We have nice color. And I will show you momentarily once I get a shot I like. So we still in, on camera there. You can still see me? Yep. Okay, well, we can see you setting up the shot. Uh, I have some questions coming in. So just to confirm, we're using only natural natural light from your kitchen right now, or from your yes. kitchen window right now. That's right. Um, we, I have um, uh, north, I have northeast exposure here. So um, the, the exposure is uh, to my uh, to my right, to the, I guess it looks like the left in the camera. Uh, yep. <laughs> so um, the light is coming in. Uh, it's a, it's sort of an open sunny day, but we only get direct sunshine in the morning. Uh, so it's sort of got that nice neutral uh, balance. So once you find it uh, with your camera, it'll stay that way for quite a while. So it it's a good. Uh, it's it's definitely a good um, place to shoot food. So yeah. Um, I'm going to go side light and see if I get something a little different here. Um, and I'll show you guys one of the shots once I get. Yeah, I mean, it's get, we're getting in there. And I can show you. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, so wow. you can see the light's Great. really balanced and nice, um, especially yeah. when I go side lit. So hope you're all enjoying my jorts. <laughs> there's a lot of color and a lot of uh, yeah, you know, it's things that beautiful. are happening there's a lot of texture and obviously the more you play around with the, oh, yeah. the, well, the more you play around with it and, and you think about what you want to get out of it um, you know I wouldn't stick chopsticks in the bowl um, that some in some uh, Asian cultures uh, is considered bad luck um, so it's oh. not something that um, you want to just kind of stick them in there and leave them st sticking out. Um, that's not something that uh, some people would would appreciate. So I would uh, I would shy away from doing it that way when I when I'm propping something like this. Also, crossing them so in some cultures is uh, also considered sort of bad form or bad luck. Um, I oh. try not to, but there are times creatively that it, it looks actually that much better uh and it's uh it's not a universally you know uh looked down upon practice but it's you know there are some things that are a little bit more ominous than others uh yeah but if you have uh you know the wherewithal to sort of prop them up on the side or put them down here or not at all or whatever you uh you want to kind of remind yourself that there are different cultural cues that have um uh 
you know, significance uh, when you're when you're uh, attempting to recreate something uh, that's not of your culture. So uh, yeah, that's and some, I think some that, of the things that speaks to, you know, how we started off the episode today, which was, you know, you talking about how when you are creating food um, and you are a food photographer, you know, really being conscious of uh, calling out the culture that you are taking photos of, talking about who is cropping and making sure you are actually, um, you know, being culturally appropriate when you're taking your photos. And I think that, you know, that's a tip that you just said that a lot of people might not have known. And um, being aware of that as you're taking photos is really important um, to playing, paying true homage to the dish you're creating. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think in terms of how you present your food is, is just as important as the, the ingredients in the food. And when we, um, when we are uh, exploring other cultures and we're moving into things that are unfamiliar, um, I think it's, it's wise to not approach it with an arrogance that says, I know what I'm doing here, or to try to make it uh, something that's not yours. Um, I think that's, I'm dancing around that pretty carefully because I don't want to be on a soapbox, but I do want to make sure that when we're talking about how this food is brought to us in restaurants as, as it is, this is, this is, it's fine the way it is. It doesn't need to be reinvented, you know? And I think that there are times that yeah. we, uh, we, we take the, um, we take the liberties of reinventing foods that are uh, culturally not of our own uh, and, and forgetting about where they come from. And I, I have no problem with experimenting and, 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 and fusion. You know, we use that word pretty often uh, yeah. with the caveat that says, let's make sure that we're uh, making, we're making sure that we understand what the, the source material is, right? It's like, it's like when you're writing your term paper in college, right? You don't want to plagiarize. And I think that's one of the yeah. one, one, that's one of the um, sort of t core tenets of any creative form is that yes, we all copy each other, and we all um, have a sense of um, unity in that we're we're doing very similar things. But let's not forget that you know, rock and roll wasn't born in in the '60s, right? You know, yeah. that, that music, that music, that music was born long before that. And it was, it was sort of uh, accumulated into what we know now. So that's very true of food as well. So I think it's important to just yeah. grasp that, you know, and, you know, let's, uh, let me jump back into the photography and basically talk about yeah. some of the elements in the bowl. Um, you know, things that have a lot of ingredients um, have the tendency to become very complicated. And I think that what you have to do is remember that, you know, color, shape, form, texture, all of these things are um, essential elements in taking a good food photo. And that if you forget those things, um, it becomes, it could become kind of messy, right? You just want to assemble and build your, um, your presentation in a way that um, has uh, meaning in terms of the food itself, but also creatively to make it look like something that is both appetizing and artistic. So I think those are the aspects of getting the colors right, about getting the the, uh, the cook times right on things like the, the jammy egg or like the meats, what you want the, the, the meats to be brown the right way. So all of those kind of elements to this are are complicated. It's not an easy thing to, to get right. But when you do get it right, it's really rewarding and you make a nice shot. So um, like I said, I'm shooting side lit here. I'm pushing the camera a little bit just to get what I want out of it at 1600 ISO. Uh, I'm, I'm coming in with a bounce card on this side and I'm going to take a horizontal shot. And yeah, one more time. So I want to point out just how balanced and even the light is here. We have just yeah, a little I bit mean, of shadow. Yeah, that's beautiful light. Yeah, we have just a bit of balance um, in equity here, just a tiny dark, bit darker on one side. But I'm going to try to highlight that now, and I'm going to flip this card around to black. 
and see if we get a little bit more shadowing, especially if I get in tight on that. And learning how to sort of play with that uh, photographically to sort of get something maybe a tiny bit more dramatic or give yourself a little bit more highlight. Don't you love the way I sound when I smash the camera up against my face? <laughs> so now you can definitively see that I have a dark side and a light side. Oh, yeah. Wow. It makes such a big difference that that uh, bounce card with the, the right. dark shadowing. It does. Right. So the more the more um, the more black I put on this side, the darker and deeper that shadow would get. So the idea that this is just a subtle kind of darkening of just the part of just this part, you know, of the side of the presentation. But if I were to put a big one here, that would create a lot more dark, a lot more shadow, yeah. a lot more co contrast. And then it might ultimately uh, create an image that's a little bit more different than, uh, than what the, one, the first one we shot. So we could do one with nothing and see what that gives us. Right. Yeah. And as a photographer, what what do you think that, you know, shadow versus light versus uh, what does it say about it, the image when you're incorporating those shadows in deeper versus using light? You know, I think it has, a, has to do for me a lot of times it has to do with place, right? Because I feel like when something mm -hmm. is just even and balanced and all well lit, uh, it doesn't feel like, to me like it has a sense of place because very often when we're in the world, um, light is not even and perfect. Light is uh, coming yeah. in directionally, right? So I think directionality speaks to it feeling more um, real. It feels more like I'm in the yeah. real world rather than feeling um, like I'm in a studio. And I think food, when it starts to feel like it's in a studio, starts to lose that sense of, um, of place. And then we're not at the dinner table anymore, or we're not at the restaurant anymore, or we're not in a, a food setting anymore. Now we're in a studio and this is now an object. So I think that one of the, one of the main reasons why I approach it this way is because, and I've said this before, is like, I want to feel like the food is I walk into a beautifully naturally lit room and they see this food on the table and I just want to capture it the way it is. So obviously that mm -hmm. takes a lot of craft quite often or a, or a situation where the lighting in the environment you're in is perfect. Um, but if it isn't perfect, then you have to try to nudge it along a little bit. And I think that's what we just did. And uh, I show you the picture that we made um, just a minute ago where, uh, we had the bounce card in, incorporated was very even, very balanced, yeah. right? Then I have one that we made with no um, bounce card at all. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, this one is with, this is with the black card. So you can see the, the okay. difference in the in the one side of the frame is definitely yeah. definitively darker. And then this one is somewhere in the middle. And it's very subtle. Yeah. But, I mean, but you, you can you know, see the difference. Right. I mean the subtleties in, in the balance between light and shadow um, when it comes to uh, food photography really makes a difference too in the, in sort of the micro aspects of it where there's cre shadow created inside the bowl. And I think that's where you start to get edging and, and texture um, with your food inside the bowl as well as what's happening in your environment. Um, and all of that matters uh, to make the image feel more alive and feel more present in, yeah. in the real world rather than in a sterile studio environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had one question that's come in that, and maybe you know the answer to this, maybe you don't, is is it the same uh, idea of using a spoon in um, in the bowl, like chopsticks in the bowl? Would you, as no. a prop person? Okay. I mean, I think if you could make it work in the bowl with the spoon, that's fine. I think there's one thing that I heard about uh, culturally was that when you stand up the 
the, the chopsticks in the bowl, there's some kind of uh -huh. death reference. There's some kind of okay. reference to death or mourning or something to that effect that I've, I've become aware of that it's that's why it's not a, um, a practice that you want to kind of go and do because some people would feel that's really, you know, it's different than bad luck. It's more like a remembrance of the dead. So it's something like that. I think that when you start to cross the line into things that make people feel uncomfortable about when you're attempting something that's not of your culture, it's better to take um, a lighter hand and a lighter approach yeah. than to just charge ahead and do things that may ultimately feel disrespectful. Yeah. That makes so, sense. So uh, everyone's really appreciating showing the different uh, the different lighting setups, um, and I think just just so everyone knows, we, Andrew, I'll have you share those three different photos with us uh, after after this episode, and we'll share them so everyone can kind of see them side by side of what what that difference is, um, because yeah, people are are interested in seeing what that looks like. Right, just um, that simple. Susan. I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I was just saying, uh, we, get, we were just getting a couple of comments of, uh, well, Bob Lorraine says that he needs to read your book again. Uh, Susan saying, who knew that chopsticks had such deep meaning? Um, yeah, it sounds like you're really educating people right now, which is uh, great. And it's, it's nice to have people so interested in, um, you know, diving into different cultures of food. And this, this has been great today. Yeah, I mean, I think the overlaps between different Asian cultures are, you know, there's the subtlety of difference, and then there is this, there are certain things that are very common, uh, m much like European food, um, that there is a commonality to certain uh, presentations, but then there's obviously the differences that are subtle. Um, that's very much here in a, in a dish that most likely um, is remembered as a Japanese dish, which has Chinese roots, which has been uh, reinterpreted by Korean people, right? So we have a, a wide array of, of culture. And then, of course, if you start to get into the culture of noodle soup in general in Asia, then you start to get into the different variations, you know, where pho yeah. is, is, is more of a, a, a in, um, in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, and the derivatives thereof uh, in that part of the countries, I mean, that part of the continent uh, as well. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, I want to continue to explore these things. I've learned an awful lot uh, in my time in food, uh, but there's obviously a lot more to learn. And uh, one of the things that I'm not as familiar with is your culture and the food and yeah. cooking the food of your culture. And I think that we've had some private discussions about this, but I think that um, I'd like to, you know, learn more about uh, the culture you come from and that, and you, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and, and, uh, and what our idea is for next week. Yeah, so um, I am, I'm a biracial. Uh, my mom is American and my dad came here to the US in the 70s from Goa, India. Um, so uh, we, next week, I am gonna teach Andrew how to make um, I haven't decided what it's going to be, but it's going to be some sort of traditional go in food and he's going to get all the ingredients and I'm going to tell him how to cook um, something that's that's close to my heart. And I'm excited to teach you uh, a little bit more about Indian food, but also uh, be able to kind of turn the tables a little bit and uh, kind of experience what it's like to be teaching you as you're making it. Um, I think it, it's going to be a, a fun, a fun episode where we get to dive into a different culture. And our goal going forward in general is um, to really dive deeper into a more diverse food. And so we would love to hear from everybody in the comments if you have dishes that you're interested in or you would like to, um, you know, maybe even come on and teach me and Andrew how to make something of your own from your own culture. I think we can figure that out with our amazing production team. So we'd love for you guys to leave in the comments um, different dishes that you would be interested in learning or um, if you would like to point us towards somebody who should teach us something, we would love to hear that as well. So um, thank you so much for everybody tuning in this week. It was really fun to dive in to a little bit more about 
uh, your wife's culture and learn about your love for ramen. Uh, I think I'm going to go make some ramen for lunch today. It looks so good. And uh, I think we, we talked about this real briefly. I, me and my husband after, um, oh my gosh, now I'm totally forgetting the name of the movie. Uh, the Korean movie that was best picture this year. Parasite, thank you. Uh, right after we watched it, and we absolutely loved that movie, we went out to our Korean uh, grocer and got the the ramen and made that uh, ramen. We found the, I think the New York Times had a, a, a you know, fake recipe that was pretty much yeah. what she makes in Parasite, and uh, we went and made it ourselves. So I still have some of those re leftover ramen noodles that I, I think I'm going to have to use today. That was uh, the day. The day that. Um that movie won all those Academy Awards. There was an awful lot of cheering going on in my living room. So yeah, I uh, can the, imagine the, the the cultural pride that people feel even when they come uh, to the U.S. and and become citizens and and have uh, integrated themselves into this culture. Um, those kind of moments, and I, I lived this with my in-laws and in, in watching um, <clears throat> Korean athletes, Korean actors. Um, you know, uh, people who have become prominent in music uh, become stars here in the U.S. is a huge source of pride back in, yeah. in Korea. And I know that that's true of a lot of cultures that um, coming to the U.S. and, and, and making it here uh, is something that uh, a lot of people get uh, a, a large source of pride from uh, back home. So I think yeah. that, you know, we keep that in mind when, uh, when we're consuming a lot of the things that come from other parts of the world and also, you know, embracing the idea that culture uh, is universal. We all bring something to the table. So I think it's, um, I think we took a nice step in the right direction today. I'm really happy with how this uh, went. Um, I didn't know you were uh, originally, your family's from Goa. I know Goa is a beach town. I think there's some surfing there. And, uh, there it is. Might, might might be a trip in the future. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I I think that from us creating this show together, we've we've learned we have a lot of commonalities because I my my husband plays poker too, and I know you're a big poker buff. So yes, well we'll yep. uh we'll have to dive deep into Goa and poker in our next episode. That sounds terrific. So. All right. Uh, thank you. That was a great. Uh, I, I'm glad you guys liked it, and uh, I'm gonna. I'll give you some uh, of uh, our tips and things that we put together for this. And uh, I don't have a, necessarily have a recipe for you, but uh, I think the the episode stands by itself to teach you how to do it. Yeah, totally. So everybody, uh, please subscribe to our uh, Facebook page or make sure you tune in every Monday at uh, Creative Live backslash TV at 12 p.m. PST. And you'll see me and Andrew making different food each week. And like I said, next week, we're going to dive into some go in food from India. And I'm going to be teaching Andrew how to make something yummy so tune in next week at monday at 12 p.m pst and we'll see you then If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, try tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline? It's medicine. Wow.
actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content. But now, if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours.